Um, so my name is Nikita Yogaraj. I am a South Asian American artist and printmaker based in Baltimore, Maryland. Um, I've been living here for the last six years and I've been uh, an artist uh, pretty much my whole life. <laughs> um, I've been drawing before I can remember um, and it's been, um, the commitment level has varied over the years, but this is something that is um, one of the most meaningful things that I've been able to do with my life. So um, my in initial um, intention was to show you some fancy slides and do a little bit of a, a quick dive into the history of block printing before I go on to a studio demonstration where I uh, walk you through the steps I use for block printing. Um, but because um, I am uh, gonna be on one screen instead of two, um, I'm going to be giving you that crash course um, without slides and you are just going to have to imagine a little bit of it with me and I'll do my best to to paint it for your imagination. Um, so let's get started. So I'm gonna be going through a little bit of history of block printing. I will walk through um, a couple examples of, of my work um, and then I will be walking through the steps of block printing um, in the way that I do it. Um, so, and I believe that we'll at the very end, we're gonna have a Q and A. Um, so to start, um, so, Block printing is actually a form of relief printing um, and it's done by carving away a material such as wood and linoleum. And um, the, the material that is left is what uh, you can roll ink on and um, to actually create the registration of a print. And the earliest record of block printing is actually found in China. Um, it was woodcuts that were done onto silk and later on paper. And afterwards it spread to Japan, um, the rest of Asia, the rest of Europe. Um, and it was also used as um, for textiles um, in about 12th century India as well. Um, and specifically, um, the most common types of uh, block printing materials are wood for woodcut and linoleum for lino cuts. And my specialization is lino cuts. Linoleum was actually uh, invented in the 800, 1800s in the UK by Frederick Walton. Um, and it was actually initially invented as a flooring material, but by the 1890s, artists were actually using it uh, for block printing by creating lino cuts. Um, and um, fast forward to today, um, when you think of specifically protest posters and you think of, you think of like the protest posters of the 60s and 70s. Um, and one of the reasons for that actually is that in the United States specifically, uh, printmaking was used as a way of creating art with political messaging that was very easy to distribute. Um, it could be mass produced and the most common form, at least found in the United States, was actually silkscreen, which is a form of printmaking different from block printing. But block printing was used absolutely for social engagement art and political art in other countries um, earlier than that. One example would be in the 1950s and a little bit earlier, um, many Mexican artists, including Diego Rivera, who was a printmaker as well, as well as a muralist, used it as a way of political art messaging that was easy for um, very reachable to broad audiences. And so those are some of the examples um, for history and block printing. And then I will go through some of the processes that I use for my work. Um, I'm going to do a really quick uh, pause so that I can uh, move my phone to the mount so that you can see what it looks like on my studio table. And we're gonna get started from there. Okay, so for block printing, there are several different kinds of tools involved, and I'm going through, going to go through each of them here. So linoleum is the material that I will be using to carve with, and linoleum is carved using these certain kinds of carvers. Um, this carver is composed of a handle and a specific carver that can be switched out for different widths. Um, and there are different brands of carvers on the market. And this one is one where you can actually switch it out um, through a Speedball brand carver. I have a couple different options so I don't have to do as much switching, but I'll also go through the process for this one. And then um, this is the linoleum. I have a pretty large piece over here, but you probably, if you have one with you, you're gonna have a pretty small one with you. And when, you, when we get to the inking and the rolling process, we are gonna be using um, this roller. 
um, which will be used for rolling block, block, block printing ink specifically. And when you are using block printing ink, there's actually several different kinds of inks that are available out there. So this is actually a water-based ink. Um, and this is a great starting ink because it is um, water soluble, which means that it could be washed really easily with soap and water. And the other plus side is that it actually dries pretty quickly rel relative to oil-based inks. And so the, the, those are the primary kinds of inks that you're gonna find, oil-based inks and water-based inks. So water-based inks uh, dry in about two hours. And that's a pro if you want to, if you're, you know, you typically you're air drying your print um, and you don't want it to take two days, which is what oil-based inks will take. Um, the cons is that because these inks dry faster, you actually have a smaller amount of time to work during the printing process because as you're rolling out your ink and as you're printing your block, all the while uh, water-based inks are drying at a higher, like a faster rate than would an oil-based ink. And often what you'll find is that oil-based inks um, are have much richer pigmentation and can be um, made for, uh, typically made for higher end prints because of that. Um, but of course, you usually have to wait at least a few days to drip for those um, inks to dry. So, but today we're gonna be using water-soluble, water-based ink. And because we're gonna be using a pretty small block and I'm gonna show you how to be able to print um, using your hands, you can actually use a wooden spoon, you can use a metal spoon, you can use your hands, or um, you can use what's called a baron, which is a um, handheld, a uh, pressure maker that you can use during the printing process. So this is a quick overview of the tools that I'm gonna to be using. Um, and I also have with me um, a sketch that I have together. And this is actually what I'm gonna be carving. Um, and specifically, I have drawn this onto tracing paper. And the reason I draw this onto tracing paper is that when you carve a linoleum block or a woodcut, any sort of block print, the design that you have carved into here, when it's printed, it's actually going to be a reverse um, of what was actually carved in the block. And so my way of making sure that I have all the details that I need, um, I start with a drawing on tracing paper, which is upright. When I transfer this using um, just pressure onto the linoleum block, it's going to be a reverse image, um, but that ensures that the print made at the very end with this block is going to be upright the same um, style that I did for this one. So when you are using a um, using tracing paper and you want to use that as a way of easily transferring a design to a block, you wanna use an HB2 pencil and not a mechanical pencil or pen. The reason that you wanna use an HB2 pencil is because the graphite is what is gonna transfer from the tracing paper to the block. Um, and so HB2 pencils are ones that have the most graphite and have the best transfer so that you can get as clear of a de design as you can for when you're carving. So, and then once you have your design, the way that you're gonna be able to transfer it is that you flip it over so that the pencil side is in contact with the linoleum. You're going to use anything to really add some sort of pressure. You can use your thumb. I'm going to be using um, the handle of my carver. And I'm gonna be transferring it like this. You wanna make sure that you get all the areas that have pencil on them.
And during the process, you can definitely um, pin it down and then check to see how well your design is transferring and also where you might need to go back and add um, extra pressure for errors or even extra graphite if you want. And the nice thing about it is that once you have your design transferred, you can always go back onto the block and fill in areas that um, will make things clear and also easy as a guide for you for what to carve away and what not to. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to fill in some of the gaps using a pencil, which is can go actually directly onto the block as well. Okay, so now we have a design onto the block. Um, I wanted to tell you also a little bit more about this specific linoleum that I've used and also included in the supply list. This is actually called, this is a brand called Soft Cut Linoleum, and it's different from traditional linoleum um, that you'll find both, you'll find both options in supply stores, art supply stores, um, in that it's actually designed for carving for artists, and so it's actually a lot softer to cut than the traditional linoleum will find. You should go ahead and definitely try that if you want, and often it'll have um, like a jute backing to it, but um, it can be a little bit more challenging to carve into um, than this brand, so soft cut, S-O-F-T-K-U-T. And the nice thing about this brand as well, um, and the way that I use it, is that there are definitely blocks that I've made as double-sided designs, um, because it's actually thick enough that you can carve on both sides and still have designs that without cutting completely through the block. So now that we have our design onto the block, I'm gonna show you how to carve a design. Um, this one is showing a couple of fig leaves and part of a prickly pear cactus in this one. Um, and there are different kinds of carver shapes you're going to find when you actually put together your handle. So I'm actually going to take this out to show you at some point when you want to switch out the um, shape carver, you are going to accidentally or in on purpose take apart um, the entire handle. So you have the handle. You have a couple different pieces within what is actually holding the carver in place. Um, and this is actually consisting of two separate pieces. 
So these are two separate pieces that are going to come together and the gap that you see between them is actually where the carver is going to fit. So if I can try and show you from this angle, when you switch out uh, one carver for another, you're going to fit it in into this gap. And this is all the while while this is going to be kept unscrewed. You might have to do a little bit of wiggling. And then screw it completely in. So the way that you're, gonna able, you're able to tell the different kinds of shape carvers is actually looking at it directly, um, like face up. And what you're going to notice is that these are two different kinds of almost V shapes. And this one is actually a lot skinnier um, than this one. So the different shape carvers that you end up using will actually result in different width lines that are being carved out of the linoleum. And this is something that over time you're going to learn which ones work for which part of your design. Um, and I would encourage you to definitely try some out right now as well. And what typically happens is that I'm going to be starting out by outlining what I'm going to carve here with the carver that allows for the smallest line, because I find that it allows me more range of movement, which gives me more detail in the outlines. And then if I have a lot of negative space that I'm going to be carving away, I will switch to a, a, a carver that has gives me a bigger width line. So we're going to start with this one. Um, and when you are carving a block, I'm going to show it to you this way so you can kind of see what the angle is going to be looking like. Um, you are going to be holding your carver almost kind of wrapped around your palm. And you'll have one finger here and a th your thumb here. So you're having a good amount of grip here by having it hug your palm like this. And when you are coming in contact with the linoleum, you're actually gonna be almost parallel to the linoleum, but at the very beginning, it's almost like a plane landing where you have a little bit of an angle. Um, and the angle is what allows you to actually cut into the linoleum. And then once you have a little bit of cut down, then you're gonna go parallel um, and parallel and then that's how you get a carved line. Let me see if I can come a little down closer. Okay, so I'm going to start carving, and I'm specifically using um, a width carver that's relatively small and has a smaller line. And I'll also show you how these lines look different with different carvers. So as you can see here, this carver created a wider line than this one did. So I'm gonna start with the, the thinner carver for outlining the details. And as you're carving, if you're carving along with me, I want you to keep in mind that anything that is carved away is not gonna show up as ink. Um, and that can be a little bit of a tricky thing to, to imagine. Um, Hey, Nikita, I had a question from Lisa for you real quick. Yeah, go for it. Hi there. Hi. Yeah, I'm wondering, I'm, I'm playing with this, and I'm wondering how much 
pressure are you putting on? Are you, you, you go over it more than once, so you put a light amount of pressure on it the first time? So you usually are gonna be making a line in one spot only once. So you do wanna add a good amount of pressure. The goal with the pressure is actually just to make sure that um, this, like the, 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 the depth of what is carved is lower than the block that's left. And that's pretty much the only goal. So if you make a really, really deep carving versus a really light carving, um, you know, the negative space for both of those carvings is still going to be negative space when you print it. Um, neither of them are going to show up. And so you do want to add like a good amount of pressure because you're not going to try and get that same line again. But after a certain point, um, how deep you have gone doesn't really matter for the inking process. Does that okay. make sense? Yes. Thank you. Yeah. And so because this is a pretty soft cut, I will, I am going to be adding definitely some pressure, but what you'll find for traditional loom is might, you might end up needing to add uh, quite a bit more pressure, but a good amount of pressure is good, is, is important. And for this particular design, there's actually a couple of different styles I could have done this with. Um, what I'm choosing to do here is I'm going to be leaving blocks of shapes that's going to be the uh, cacti and I'm going to add a little bit of texture for the prickly parts um, and later by carving away a couple of small areas. But I've chosen to keep them as solid color shapes as blocks. You could totally reverse the style and say, okay, well, I want the background to be ink while the, the actual cacti shapes are mostly negative space or maybe mostly only like outlines. And so there are actually um, quite a few different ways that you can choose how to depict um, one design or one image um, using block printing. Here, there's a lot of overlap between different parts of the cactus. Um, and so I am focusing on making outlines to be able to distinguish these overlapping shapes. And what I'm gonna do in a little bit is start carving away some of the negative space, something that the parts of it that are actually not gonna be inked. And that's gonna help really bring out, um, bring out some of these shapes. So one thing you can definitely do because there's only so much of a range of motion you can have um, when the block is one, in one place when you're carving is, especially for smaller blocks, um, you can also move around the, the block while you're moving it, while you're carving. And so that might give you an extra dimension of being able to um, carve, especially smaller details.
And it, this isn't so much of a concern with my block because my block is pretty big. Um, but especially when you're working with smaller blocks, you want to make sure that the hand that you're using that's free and not carving is not in the way of the direction that you're carving, um, especially with traditional linoleum, because because of the amount of pressure that you're adding, and it's definitely difficult to carve, it's very, very possible that you can accidentally go too far. And in, the, in that instance, this can actually, the, the carver can actually uh, cut into your skin. So when you are working with this, you wanna make sure that the direction that you're carving is away from the free hand that you have. And that's where moving the block around can be helpful so that um, whatever direction you're carving, it, can, it helps you make sure your hand is not in the way. I've definitely cut myself um, that way before, so I do want to caution you. So now that I have a little bit of the outline carved out, I'm actually gonna switch um, the carver into something wider and I'm gonna carve away some of the negative space. And I often alternate between these two just as a way of um, taking a break from working on, on smaller details and that um, to be able to, to work on some, some broader ones. So I will say that different printmakers tend to use this negative space differently. Um, in this instance, I've pretty much carved away anything because I want um, this area that isn't gonna be this fig leaf totally white. Um, but in other designs, and we all often see different printmakers doing is that you can actually use the carving away of negative space as an opportunity to create different actually kinds of textures in the background. Um, let's say that this is, this, these fig leaves are the foreground and what's being carved away is a background. The background could be white, or if you chose to leave some of the areas uncarved or have a kind of pattern where you've left some areas uncarved, 
you can actually create different kinds of textures using the lines that are left over. And you might not be able to see it here, but once I start inking this, you might see that some of the these skinny lines um, are going to be showing up um, with the ink because I'm in this instance right here deliberately leaving some parts of the block uncarved as I'm carving away most of this. So you can see some of it here using the shadows. Um, but this is a way that you can create different kinds of textures in the background um, and textures that might move in different directions or kind of evoke different feelings. Okay, so now I'm going back to using the smaller width carvers to go back to some details. So I'm going to spend about five or 10 minutes more um, for the carving part. And after that, I'm going to go ahead over and 
demonstrate the process of rolling out ink, how much to use and what to look out for textures um, and then for actual hand printing. And what I'm probably gonna do and what you're probably gonna do as well is once you have a print, um, you can actually go back and continue carving after you wash the block. And that's often, that's a very common thing um, to do because inevitably you're gonna be finding that there are parts of the block that you missed and you didn't know that you missed until you have a print. Um, so carving and then printing and then going back and carving some more is definitely part of the process um, for block printing. So I'm going to go further down and add a little bit of texture to the cacti here. And I already have some points sketched out as um, things to carve out that will add a bit of the prickly texture. Um, but I would definitely encourage you to think about how different kinds of textures you can add um, can be used as a way to be able to distinguish different objects that you may have or different shapes. Um, because if you have, let's say, like lines going in one direction, um, for one object and lines going in a different direction for a different object, that would be a nice way of being able to distinguish those shapes, um, especially if they're overlapping. What you may have noticed uh, with the carvers, especially the ones that have a V shape to them, is that the different types of pressure that you might add actually might result in different kinds of lines because of this V shape. So if you had add a light pressure, you can get a smaller line with this V shape carver. Um, and with the very same carver, when you add more pressure, you could get a wider line. So that is one note about um, the V-shaped covers that you may have. 
Um, there are other carvers that you could find that um, are really thin and they only have one type of line because they don't have hold the shape specifically. So in this instance, when I'm making this kind of texture, I actually do want um, a smaller width line for this. So I'm actually at, um, applying a lighter amount of pressure um, to be able to achieve that with this carver. But as I said before, um, after a certain point, when you're talking about negative space that you're carving away, um, after a certain point, the depth of like what is carved away, um, not the width, but the depth of what's carved away doesn't really matter in terms of um, if the ink roller isn't gonna touch it and it's not gonna be inked. It doesn't matter if the depth is uh, like, let's say four millimeters versus two millimeters. Okay, so now that we have a good amount of part, just show a little bit of the design here. I am going to go ahead and show you the inking and printing process. And this block, and I am going to be actually be taking this plate. So this is actually a glass plate from an old picture frame that I have repurposed as an inking plate. You can find different uh, specific plexiglass or glass uh, plates that can be used for inking, or um, you can actually use uh, glossy calendar paper as a sort of disposable um, and affordable alternative to uh, inking plates as well. So um, I'm gonna be taking a green ink and we're gonna do a little bit of mixing actually. And I have a palette knife that I'll be using for mixing these inks. Um, as I mentioned before, we're gonna be using a water-based ink and the, this is gonna make cleanup very easy because these are uh, able to be cleaned up with soap and water. And when you're actually looking in art supply stores for different kinds of block printing inks, you should actually look out for that because it'll often say on the tube or the bottle or the description, um, washable ink or like safe wash ink or anything that says that it could be washed with soap and water is probably your go-to because there are certain kinds of oil-based inks that you'd actually need um, a sort of solvent for, or um, you might have a longer cleaning process where you have to um, add a vegetable oil to the ink um, and let it sit for a couple of about 20 minutes and then um, then add soap and then water because the oil-based ink is going to have trouble being washed away if it comes in contact directly with water first without some sort of solvent or um, in that way. 
So we are going to be using water-based ink. And the thing that you will end up finding if you experiment with different kinds of types of inks is that they're going to end up being different textures. And the amount of ink that you need and the texture of ink um, once you're applying it to the block might actually be different um, for different kinds of inks for the kind of print that you're looking for with enough ink. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that once we actually go through um, printing one block so you can see um, some of the, the ways that I'm describing this. So I'm gonna be taking a little bit of ink and this one's actually a very runny ink. I'm gonna take my roller and I'm gonna start rolling out some of this ink. And I'm gonna see if I can zoom in a little bit for you because I want you to actually be able to see what this ends up looking like on the plate. And I'm gonna angle it a bit so you can actually see the texture here. So if you can see these waves over here um, of ink, these are actually pretty big waves. And as you are rolling out ink, um, I'm gonna be rolling it out over a larger surface area to distribute the ink more and make it thinner. And as I roll this out, I'm actually gonna see the, this wave texture change. I'm gonna see it just to basically uh, turn into smaller and smaller waves. And that's actually what we're looking for because after a certain point, we're actually gonna to get to the, thick, the texture that we want that is basically ready to ink. Like it's not too much ink and it's not too little. So if you can see the difference between these waves and these, they're a lot smaller. Um, so this is closer to what we are looking for. Um, and when I am rolling out ink on with this roller, I'm actually going to not only roll back and forth without taking my roller off the block, I'm actually gonna also do a couple strokes where I do one, take it off, move it somewhere else, take it up, put it back down and over again. And the reason I'm doing that is because this is actually gonna help the ink actually get distributed through onto the roller all the way too, because otherwise you can miss some spots on the roller itself. So now that I've rolled it out to the texture that I'm looking for, I am going to switch this out um, and apply, move my block over here so that I can start rolling ink onto the block and zoom out a bit. So I am going to just start applying ink onto the block. I'm going to do a lot of rolling back and forth. And especially because there are different sized rollers, at, certain, at a certain point you're going to see that the roller is going to be running out of ink. So this is where you actually go back and get some more. You also want to keep in mind that all the while this ink, especially because it's water-based ink, as I've mentioned about you know 20 times now, is um, going to be drying quicker than some of the oil-based inks that you'll use, which means that you do want to be working quickly um, to make sure that the ink is still wet enough to make a good print. And because I have now used up all the ink here, I'm actually going back and putting more ink in the block. This is a lot of ink. I'm going to just take dip like a little bit in and roll that out as well to the texture that I'm looking for. And then go back. So in this instance, because this is the first time I'm inking this block, and what ends up happening actually is that one layer of ink on a clean block is not enough. It'll actually end up um, coming out as not as good of a print as you might like. So I'm actually going back to do another layer. And what you'll find is that once you actually doing start doing some practice and trial and error with inking blocks, you'll find that multiple thin layers of ink on a block is gonna turn out a much better print than let's say like one thick layer of ink. 
Um, and the danger with thick layers of ink is that, especially when you have thin, pla uh, thin paper that you're applying on top to print it on, the, the thickness of the ink, and because there's so much of it, will actually cause it to slide as you're printing it. Um, that will mess up your print. So now I have an inked block. I'm gonna get some paper and start the printing process. So when you are printing onto a piece of paper, let me zoom in a little bit more, um, you actually want the block to be on the table and the paper to be facing on top um, and not the other way around. You know, the paper to be on the paper and the block facing downward onto it. And the reason for that is because you are gonna get a better print where the, the point of contact is like with the paper, um, which is very thin. And so the pressure can go all the way through versus if you were trying to apply pressure on the block onto a piece of paper, the block is a lot thicker. And so the pressure doesn't transmit as well. And so you might actually end up with a weaker print in a way um, from that. So I'm going to be centering this as much as I can. One thing that you do want to do, um, especially when you're making more, uh, more prints and not a test print, I'm going to be doing a test print, so I'm not going to wash my hands before I do it. So I'm going to get some ink on this. Um, you want to center it as good as you can. Um, maybe do this first to make sure that it's, it's stuck to the page. And either you can use your hand. I'm going to do one print with my hand and one print with the Baron. I'm going to start with the Baron. So I'm going to be using the Baron by applying pressure, kind of medium pressure, I would say, in a circular motion. I'm also going to be holding um, the block and the paper with my other hand. And so I'm going to be working my way across the surface area of the paper, making sure I hit every spot. In this particular instance, the paper is actually bigger than the block that I'm using. The block is smaller than the paper. And so when you're done doing the whole surface area, you actually wanna make sure you get the edges of the paper as well, the edges of the block and paper. You wanna get the corners um, because those actually don't actually get as much pressure when you're um, printing over here, like in the main surface area of the page. So now that I've done that, I'm going to take a corner and peel it back. Okay. So there are a couple of things that we can see here. One thing is that the ink is not thin, not thick enough in some places. And there's actually places where it actually started to dry before I could finish the print. And right now, one of the reasons for that is because my fan is on in my room. And so what I'm gonna do is actually turn off my fan and before I make a second print. The other thing is that the first print that you make using a block will always never be that great. Um, once there are some, there's already a layer of ink on the block and you're going back and adding more layers. This is when you're, you'll typically get um, the amount of ink that you're looking for to get a, uh, a more consistent print. So I'm going to set this here and turn off my fan. And this was, I think, a good learning lesson because the ventilation that you have in the room can actually affect your printing process. There's actually a lot of different factors that could affect it um, and ventilation is one of them. So when you are actually working with ink and printing um, during that process, you wanna make sure that there isn't a fan running or um, an air conditioning or anything that could anything that promotes airflow because that's actually gonna make your ink dry faster. Let's see if I can just, yes.
So I'm actually going to do a little bit of color mixing here for the second print. And I would say when you're mixing colors, I'm just using a blue and a green over here to make a sort of teal. Um, a good rule of thumb is that when you are mixing a darker color with a lighter color, you want to start by having uh, maybe the darker color and the blob separately and then adding a little by little because um, it's not going to be an equal ratio for um, the color that you might be expecting. Um, if I were to put like a little bit of black, this might actually turn black very quickly. Um, so I would only add a smidgen to and slowly work my way by adding more of the darker color um, to get the color that I'm looking for. Like this. Putting down a little bit of black and then just taking very little. So a nice trick you can do when you run into a situation where you've actually rolled out too much ink um, is you can take your palette knife and you can scrape some of it off and then re-roll it out or put some ink to the side so you have less ink that you're working with to roll out. And that can help you get to the texture that you're looking for. In this instance, I'm going to put some of it in over here and only be rolling out this this amount. This is still quite a bit. Um, and I know that because I can see some big waves. So I'm going to actually use more surface area over here to thin it out. That's definitely better. So in this instance, I'm actually just, um, I haven't washed the block of the green before I add the dark blue. Um, I'm okay with this right now just because the second color I'm adding is a bit darker. But if you want the most accurate color um, possible, you actually do want to clean your block in between different color inkings that you do. Because what's going to end up happening is that, especially if one color is lighter than the other, like the second color is lighter, what's going to happen is that when you put your paper on top and then you take it out, the layers of color that are there, the first layer, like this green, the green is actually going to show up as, on, as the first layer on the paper. Um, and the blue is going to be behind um, versus right now where right now the blue is the first layer on the block and then the green is behind. Centering it as well as I can. Okay, so for this one, I'm actually going to be using my hand. And you can also be using a wooden spoon or a metal spoon. 
so because I'm going to be using my palms and because there is um, a space here that might not reach the paper as well as this part of my hand, I'm going to just make sure that when I am pressing down and I want to press down perpendicular, I don't want to go at an angle because that could make the paper slide against the ink. Um, I'm going to be making sure that every part of the paper gets different parts of my hand, especially the places where the most pressure will be able to be brought down, which is right here and right here. So this one is somewhat of a better print. A couple of things that could have happened here um, based on what you're seeing is that there is a little bit less ink over here and more over here. And when you are going through the printing process, there is gonna be a lot of trial and error and you learn over time why you might have gotten the print you've gotten. In this instance, it could have been um, likely that I didn't add, apply enough pressure here. Um, it also could have been potentially that I didn't add enough ink in this area. So as you are doing more and more prints, um, there is a lot of practice involved and a lot of balance striking um, as you're working with different factors. Some of these factors could be the type of ink that you're using and how long it takes for that ink to dry, if it dries quickly or slowly. The other factor, as I mentioned before, is ventilation. Um, you want little airflow to be able to have a more of a working time um, during the inking and printing process. Um, and what you also find is that the different weights of paper and different textures of paper that you use might actually need different amounts of ink to get um, like a consistent print. So I would definitely encourage you to explore and know that there's a lot of trial and error involved um, because it's a lot of, there's only so much theory that you can get before um, that, you know, the, the best thing you would do is just get as much experience as you can because it's gonna be experience that could tell you being like, okay, this is the right texture amount of, uh, of ink that I need um, to be able to have a good print on this kind of paper. Um, and this is the kind of, this is the amount of ink that I need for this brand of ink that I'm using or the water-based ink that I'm using um, versus the amount of ink that I need for an oil-based ink that I'm using for this kind of paper. So um, there are different elements that you're gonna be balancing and with experience, you're gonna get better and better at balancing those. So I'm gonna do one more print in black. I actually would go back and do a little bit of carving and then do a black print um, and then kind of wrap up from there and, and leave some room for questions. So here, I'm actually not going to wash my block before um, I carve because I'm gonna to have to end up washing my carver after, but it's actually gonna be a lot easier for you to see um, some of the positive and negative space and also some of the textures that are happening here. I'm also working off of a, the reference of my sketch while I'm doing this um, because it can help highlight some of the details that may have not come through um, during the transfer of the graphite to the block.
So I want to point out something that I had talked a little bit about earlier when I was carving, and that is some of the different textures you will end up finding um, in the negative space when you're carving. So now that there's ink on it, you can actually see how there are areas where this is actually going to be totally blank. And these are areas where you're actually going to see a little bit of texture, line texture, um, because of what was left behind as I was carving. And so this is under, this can usually for you kind of be developed into your own personal style for the way that you are approaching um, the design of your block prints um, and having different textures in the foreground and background um, again could be used in a lot of different ways um, to be could be part of your signature style that you develop when you are creating your block prints.
So over here, um, because I have a little bit of overlap between the, the leaves here and the leaves here, um, I'm actually going to be using a couple different width lines <clears throat> to kind of better distinguish um, these shapes. So I have a certain width line over here and over here that I've used for the outline of this, but I'm actually going to go in and create a larger curved line in the overlap, and that can help better distinguish these shapes. Okay, so before I print with black ink, I'm just going to wash the blocks a little bit. Um, what I'd ideally like to do is actually wash this in the sink, but right now I'm going to be just wiping away a little bit um, here. Um, especially because I'm interested in using a lighter green for this part of the printing process. And what I'm actually gonna do is show you one multicolor printing technique. Um, I'm not gonna apply it fully to this block um, because there's a design on the other side I wanna preserve, but I'll show you a little bit of what that's gonna look like. Just gonna get another paper towel um, to finish the rest. Actually, this. Again, one of the really nice things about water soluble ink is easy cleanup. So the other thing to note is that with water-based ink, you can end up sometimes leaving ink on the block and then washing it later. 
you definitely cannot do that with oil-based ink because you don't know if it's going to become much more trouble to wash off once it's dry, once the ink is dried. Um, and instead of trying to just layer on the darker colors onto what I'm doing, because I've let some time pass between um, the inking process and inking again, um, what's going to happen is if I had just left this ink here when I added a more ink, there's going to be like a dried out layer and that's going to interfere with the, the print that's going to happen. So if you try and make a print using a block that already has some dried out ink and then you're applying more ink on top, what's going to happen is there's going to be some flaking um, and that will um, really not make a consistent print for you. Okay. So one thing you can do um, with water-based inks and other inks as well is if you have some ink left over, you can actually just take a little bit of aluminum or a small jar if you have it and scrape the ink and put it into the aluminum that you can wrap together um, or in a jar and you can save it for later. Um, I don't have a jar with me, so I'm gonna just put this onto the side and I'm gonna scrape some of this away too. But I am going to leave some and see how the shade of green I'm going to get. Because this is a blue, back, black, green mix. I get a really light green if you add a little bit to a lot of yellow. So I'm gonna keep this green here. And I'm gonna be adding some black because I'm gonna make this actually into a two color print on the same block. Gonna wipe my roller first. One trick that I do use for um, an easy way of, of cleaning a lot of rollers at once and palette knives as well is I'll keep a bowl of water, like a full plastic bowl, and I'll keep that as a sort of a bath that I put dirty rollers into so that I could soak. Um, and I could just go and wipe it off um, from there. And sometimes I add some soap. Okay, so we are gonna be trying a two color printing technique with this one. So what I'll normally do is I'm gonna decide right now that this is gonna be one color right here, the, these big leaves and the cacti is gonna be a different color. And wherever that boundary mark is gonna be, I'm actually going to, if I were to do this all the way, I'm gonna, I would cut this block. I would actually cut from here through here. And I would make sure that there's a lot of smooth, like some curves in my cut. I'm not gonna make edgy cuts or sharp edges because what's gonna happen is that um, I'm gonna be inking these two blocks separately so that I don't get the wrong color in the wrong block. And I'm gonna be piecing it back together like a puzzle. Um, for the, the print so that I could have multiple colors on one block. And if you have sharp edges in your block that you're trying to piece back together, it's actually gonna be a lot more difficult for it to come back together than if you have some like um, curvy areas. So in this particular block, I'm not gonna cut it. I'm just gonna do my best to make sure that it stays in the boundary that I want it to stay into. Um, but I would suggest trying one of those techniques. Um, 
the only thing is that once you cut it, you can't really go back to having a whole block with that. So it, you'd have to commit. And a lot of block printing, as you may have seen, is about <laughs> making a commitment because once you carve something, you can't take it back. And once you cut a block, let's say for, because you've decided that you want it to be multicolor, you can't take that back either. Okay, so I'm going to start with a fig in green, roll it out to the texture that I'm looking for. And then what I'm going to do is roll the black. I should be allowing more space between these two colors, but right now I'm just going to let them accidentally mix in the glass a bit. I'm going to be working quickly because I don't want the ink to dry. I'm not trying, going to try not to spend too much time inking. So I'm gonna do the same thing I did before with the Baron and use some circular motions applying pressure across. Again, I've gotten a little bit of ink on here, but I usually would be washing my hands in between the inking part and the printing part to prevent this. So here you have a multicolor print. And this is a great way to experiment with multiple colors um, and be able to have all this in one block um, because there are actually a couple other printing techniques that you can use to be able to have multiple colors, um, but with a little bit more commitment. So if I were to try and do a reduction print, um, reduction prints are a process where you can carve a little bit of a design, you can apply one color, uh, print the edition that you wanna print. Let's say you, you wanted to have an edition of 10 prints. You will ink all of those and then go back, back and 
or some more um, that you can lay like a different color. Um, and it could be some accent colors or some accent shapes that end up being on the same card, the same block. So if I wanted my, my cacti to have some shadows and that's on just my cacti, I could print this and then go back and carve away the parts that I wanna leave the original color on my prints and then just leave the shadows that I'm looking for. And then I would go back and ink with a different color and then print my 10 on top of my existing 10 prints to get the additional layer of color. And because I'm actually reducing the amount of design on the block each time between the, the inkings and the colorings, that's what makes this, a that would, would make that a reduction print. And so that's actually a different technique that you can use to be able to add multiple layers of different colors and have a multicolor print. Um, but the issue with that, of course, is that you want to make sure that you have done all the printing that you want with the first layer so that when you carve, because when you carve um, further down, you, you can't go back to the and, and print the original design again. So that is a couple of printing techniques. Um, I'm going to do a little bit of wrap up and open some type of questions and then see how much time we have at the end um, to see if there's a couple other um, talking points. So I'm curious, and I'm actually just going to do one more completely black print and then um, end there. Um, does anyone have questions about the inking and printing process, though, as well? I still have some, some of my supplies here. So in this instance, 
especially when you can kind of see close up here. This is what you was the negative space carved away, and there's going to be little amounts of pieces here that, um, and this, I've accidentally left these. I can always go back and carve to clean this up more. Um, and that's a normal part of the printing process. Or if you want, you can just leave those as textural interest um, as part of your block. So I have done four prints and that will conclude the demonstration portion of this. Um, I will go ahead and just turn my video back to myself and see if there's any questions that I can take. Thank you. Uh, I got a question from uh, Lisa. Hey, Lisa, okay. there. Hmm. Uh, I'm I'm not sure if Lisa has a question or not. Sorry. Okay. Is that better? Oh, there yeah. you are. Sorry. There I am. Okay. I, I was curious if you ever take the paint uh, um, that you're using and apply it directly to the printing paper to cover like a spot or something if there's like one thing that's just off. So if I apply ink to the print after the fact, after I've done yes. the print? Yes. Um, so there's a couple things about this. Um, this is actually a really great um, question and I'm gonna talk a little bit more about how to annotate and maybe sign your print and this might actually answer some of it. So the answer is if you have a print that you're making and it's really casual and you're not making a fine art print, you're not making it into let's say limited edition print, you can kind of do whatever you want um, with the prints that you have. You can paint on top of them, you can correct them, um, I, there's definitely um, a technique where I've seen people make a print and then on top of that add watercolor um, by hand for some of those things. Um, the instance in which, in which that might be seen as not cool is specifically when um, you are tr making prints that you intend to be fine art prints that you're turning into an addition. Um, and I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that. Um, right now. Um, so when you annotate a print, you want to label it using um, the number of prints in that edition that you intend. So let's say for this cacti print, I want it to be an addition of five prints. There's only going to be five prints that exist. I'll print the five and then I will number the print on the bottom left. Um, and I'll say this is print number one out of the five. So one dash or slash five, and then two slash five, three slash five. And on the right, I'll sign it and I'll add the year. Uh, and you wanna do this with a pencil, like a sharp pencil, because then even if it's erased, there's still like that imprint of that mark and that's sort of something that will help it not be forged. Um, so what, if you're making a fine art print edition in that way, um, the rules around that edition is that all of them are identical. Um, and so it is not recommended that you try and alter the print after you've done the print um, during that process to, you know, if, if there's like a mistake in it. Um, that's sort of something that you have to decide kind of like as you're printing out the edition or printing out 
um, you at the end, any prints that maybe turn out irregular um, unintentionally, you'll, you'll just have to take out and then not include when you're annotating it um, and say, this isn't part of the edition. But what that also means is, is that because you are, by making an, something limited edition, you're saying, okay, like I promise that these are the only prints of this edition that exist. Um, so if there end up being other copies that you haven't labeled, let's say I'm labeling this as, as a test print, um, P over P like test proof um, or A over P artist proof, then um, that would kind of get in the way of you certifying basically like these are the only prints that exist, you know, of this design. Does that have, you know, I'm hoping that's a little bit of um, extra information. Yes, that's exactly what I was interested in. Thank you. Yeah. Any other thoughts or questions? Um, if not, I actually, we have a couple extra minutes and I actually happen to have my art portfolio with me. And so even if I, you know, have been having trouble with my laptop and I can't do slides, I actually do have the art pieces in person and I could just go ahead and, and talk about a couple of those um, there. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. Um, so I actually have two different kinds of um, subject matter themes that I use in my work. Um, one subject theme you kind of saw when I was carving there is botanical block printing. Um, and I actually specifically like to use this as a way of representing um, different kinds of plant life that I kind of see as relevant to my ethnic identity. Um, I'm a South Asian American printmaker. Um, and I, for me, that's a very hyphenated identity. And so I, um, I'm interested in definitely representing kinds of plant life that maybe isn't represented so much in artwork um, because there's actually not that many, relatively not as many um, creative South Asian artists um, maybe compared to, to other groups. And so I wanted to show a couple examples of my larger work that is related to that, um, as well as um, work that is um, that I create as kind of depicting plant life specific to the places that I've lived. So this is one um, that's specifically of the bitter gourd plant. And bitter gourd is a vine that is a very popular vegetable in South Asian and East Asian cooking. And I have a couple of different um, works in the series of specifically trying to represent um, underrepresented uh, plant life, um, especially when it comes to kitchen gardens and kitchen cooking, which is um, for me, it's a it's a part of it's an important part of the way that I grew up and the way that I've connected to my family um, because I'm specifically the daughter of South Indian immigrants. I grew up in Houston, Texas, went to college in San Antonio, I've been living in Maryland for the last six years, and so these are some of the ways that I like to kind of depict the places that I've lived in the way that I, I've grown up. And a couple things that are uh, also along those lines is actually depicting plant life um, specific. Um, to the natural landscapes of cities that I've lived in. Um, this is actually um, a scene from Maryland wetlands. And so wetlands are, um, you can drive out a little bit and you get to these places that have shallow water and there's very specific plant life um, that um, is, is shallow waters or habitat versus like deeper water. And so this is a piece that is actually depicting Aero Arum, that's the name of this plant, and American pondweed, which kind of looks like a lily pad. And you'll often find um, these plants um, showing up together when you see the wetlands. And so for me, this is one of the ways that I, I like to use botanical subject water matter, but in very specific ways um, um, in my work. So the thing that I actually wanted to close with is I am talking about block printing from a fine art standpoint, um, but there are different kinds of artists out there. And I would actually consider myself to be more of a community rooted artist. Um, 
I didn't, I didn't come from a specific art institution. And for me, it's actually really important to have what I do be something that is made really accessible to people. And I think that's actually one of the reasons why I got into specializing in printmaking, um, coming from portraiture and illustration, because printmaking allowed me to create a limited edition work that for me fulfilled the need to be a fine artist, but being able to make it an edition um, and making it a larger edition versus a smaller edition actually allowed me to make it more accessible to people um, and so that people I know could buy it um, and not just maybe clients that are might see it in a gallery. And so for me, I this was my way of being a community artist um, versus a fine artist and there are different ways. Like there is a woman who is an artist that I very much admire, her name is Ted, uh, Tatiana Fazlalizade, and she has a very cool interview about talking about how she, the fact that she calls herself a public artist and what that means. And if you've seen her work, um, she did this what Stop Telling Me to Smile series uh, in New York, which you may have seen online, um, because her art is very public and very um, accessible in that way. And so these are the kinds of things that I'm thinking about um, as I approach my practice as an artist in, uh, in terms of like, who is it accessible to? not just in a gallery, but also like out on the street um, and what I can, how I can use printmaking to make stuff more accessible. Um, yeah, and with that, I wanted to open the floor for any more thoughts or questions. All right, well, if there are no more questions, I will go ahead and end the recording. Uh, I just want to thank everybody for coming out. Um, thank you so much, Nikita. That was a great class. Um, and I really quickly want to um, remind everybody that um, I will have the recording for this out probably later in the week. And also keep an eye out. We're going to um, publish all our spring programming offerings, I think, in the next like two weeks. So those will be up on the web and they'll come out in preview. Uh, so keep an eye out for that because we have a whole bunch more virtual stuff uh, and in-person workshops, uh, a lot of stuff that we're offering this, this spring season. So all right. Thanks, everybody. And uh, right.